Good morning, depending on where you are, or how late it was yesterday evening. Um, welcome to my presentation, Progress Developer Studio Extreme. Uh, it's a follow-up or an updated version of a presentation that I did uh, on the same subject, I think, six or seven years ago. Um, and what I'm trying to do in the next 45 minutes is yeah, show you some, some of the tips that make my life as Progress Developer Studio easier, some, some keyboard shortcuts, some plugins, um, um, some more advanced or more complicated techniques with it. Um, yeah, let's get into it. I think I can skip those slides now. So agenda for the day, I'll start with a very quick recap of Progress Developer Studio. I'm assuming that you all are using it. Um, so this is not an entry talk. Um, then doing some simple things with files, um, hotkeys, customizing templates, some startup parameters, plugins. One plugin that I like uh, specifically is the OEDT plugin, so that's why it's a separate section. Uh, dragging and dropping of text into the editor and, well, the we hated subject of using Eclipse on high DPI displays, which is always a challenge. Um, for this presentation, I have chosen not to use the full HD resolution, so I've gone against our own recommendations. I'm at uh, the half HD resolution because it just works better than going that and, and bumping up the developer studio by the 200% screen scaling. So it is a challenge. Um, Progress Developer Studio is based on Eclipse, and uh, well, as when I was preparing this talk, I was also going on the Eclipse website, I realized, well, we're not only celebrating Progress's 40th birthday here, um, Eclipse has turned 20 um, last weekend. Um, and um, the beginning of Eclipse was IBM releasing the source code of the WebSphere application developer, so that was a development environment for Java application. Um, as an open source project and um, founding the Eclipse Foundation um, where probably every big software company is, is, is a member of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and IBM did all that to yeah, increase their relevance in the Java market. Uh, the name Eclipse means uh, Java without sun. E Eclipse is the absence of sun. Uh, and in fact, sun as the inventors of Java had a hard time becoming member of the Eclipse Foundation for a long time. They did it in the end. Um, well, then they got acquired by Oracle. So what's the developer studio? Well, it's an Eclipse-based um, development environment provided by Progress Software since 10.1a, so 16, 17 years, something like that. Um, it's continuously enhanced since then, also in the recent OpenH12 releases, um, performance and stability are much better now than it was in the early 11 releases, and not to talk of the OpenH10 releases. Um, and it is just the alternative development environment to the App Builder or the OpenH Studio. The App Builder, however, is, however, is integrated to it, so you don't lose um, features. It requires a separate license, though. Um, uh, you can install them in parallel, so the easiest if you get your licenses through the OEDK, then you can install OpenEdge Studio and the Progress Developer Studio. The names are probably a little bit confusing, but that's what it is. Uh, and because it's based on Eclipse, it's extensible using third-party plugins, and that's really one of the strengths of Eclipse. Um, while Eclipse is available on other platforms than Windows, Progress has not made the Developer Studio available on Windows. It, uh, um, I mean for, for starting the progress runtime, which you need for compilation and for execution code that's just based on Windows. Um, yeah. And what are or what have been reasons why people might to the Progress Developer Studio? Um, a, probably a very big rush was for people doing GUI for .NET development. Uh, the classic app builder just doesn't have any graphical designer, doesn't have any code completion. Um, which would be required to really efficiently work with GUI 4.NET. Um, object-oriented coding, too. Um, if we write object-oriented code, um, if, even if you know the classes you're dealing with very well, without any code completion, uh, when you're typing a method name or a property name, you'd probably be lost or very inefficient. Um, there's some tooling integrated for dealing with app servers you can deploy 
code to an app server. You can trim the app server from within the developer studio. Um, I must say I'm not using that. I work differently with the app servers, but that would be a separate topic. Um, if you want to use the REST adapter, either for the classic app server or for PASOE, you have to use Progress Developer Studio a REST resource together. There's no other tooling for that. Um, Cable, the Sonar source plugin for OpenEdge, uh, is providing extensive checking of code quality by checking whether code violates predefined rules. So find without no lock and these things. Uh, and if you type code in Progress Developer Studio, you have the Capital plugin enabled. Um, while you type, whenever you save code, you would be seeing it like a compile error. You're seeing, hey, you're making a mistake which would be executable, but still not a good idea to run that kind of code. And for those which are using Corticon, Corticon Studio is also based on Eclipse, can be integrated, and so on and so on. Uh, for the for me, relevant releases of OpenEdge. I've provided here the versions of Eclipse used as a foundation for Developer Studio. That may be finding third-party plugins and their compatibility. If you find a third-party plugin um, that requires Eclipse 413 for whatever reasons or 420, uh, I think the current one is 425, um, then yeah, you may try if it works on 11.7, but the chances are high that it doesn't. Um, good. So let's start with some, some simple things. One thing which I find extremely helpful and probably use on an almost daily basis, if you go into the property menu, the property sheet of, of a file or a folder, so in the um, explorer, the project explorer, you right click a file and go into properties. Then you see this dialog here. And the nice thing is that the file path in the Eclipse notation, so with forward slashes, or the Windows notation with backward slashes, you can select that and use copy and paste to paste it into your code. So if you have like a config file like Peter showed in the session um, just before lunch, and you need to know the name of this config file in your source code, as a quoted string or whatever, just select it there, copy, paste it in the source code, very handy. Uh, um, as in many applications, Alt-Enter is the shortcut key to open the context menu. So just Alt-Enter, then you probably use a mouse to select the text. It's probably possible to get there with lots of tabbing, but uh, I then use the mouse, like you can also see the mouse on the screenshot there. Um, another thing you can do, um, if you're on a file in the um, File Explorer, right-click it, there's a show in, System Explorer, and what that does is it opens the Windows Explorer window with that file selected. That is also extremely useful for a couple of things. Sometimes you just want to delete an R code, get the feeling file doesn't compile for whatever, am I running the old R code, just delete it. So right click, show in System Explorer, go one file down, that's the R code typically, and delete it. Or, and I used that in the last couple of days when I was deploying the code to the website of the conference, um, when I made a change to a single class and the way to deploy it was show in System Explorer and copy and paste it into the terminal server session of the, of the server that's running the conference site. Um, there are probably more professional ways of deploying applications, but that's just a very quick way of doing it. Um, alternative way is in the properties dialog, there's also a button there to the far right end that also navigates to this file in the Windows Explorer. Something that um, can also be useful is marking folders as a derived resource. And it took me a couple of years to realize what that actually means. Um, Developer Studio is there to write source code. And the result of source code is typically a binary or some other intermediate file format. And those are files which usually for the developer are not relevant. Um, and for if you're using PCT to compile your project every now and then, you have a .pct folder. And if you use the open resource dialog to open, um, to search for a file, you would also see the PCT temp files there. But I bet they're not relevant for you. So you can mark them as derived 
So you go into the properties of that folder, check the derived, and then they will be hidden from the file search, from the resource thing, and, and, and dialogues like that. That project, I knew it wasn't possible some time ago. I don't know. think it's, it's, it's part, part of, of the file um, or the project XML file. I think it's part of the workspace configuration, so every developer has to redo it. So Jill's question was whether the derived attribute on the folder is stored in a, in a location that can be shared with other colleagues, and I believe it is not. So every developer needs to do that himself. There are a couple of hotkeys which are useful. I'm not going into all of them, um, or not demo all of them, but Control D is, is, is useful for deleting the current line. Um, the find and so on, um, quick outline to navigate in, in a large file. Um, so and generally with all those hotkeys, navigation, in, even in a large project, is really trivial. So if I open one of our classes, I've pushed Control shift r um, the open resource. A resource is a file name. And I can use this dialog to search just by capitals. So that's a good incentive for capital uh, using mixed case on your file or class names. Um, I could also use wildcard characters, question mark or asterisk. So if I open a class, first thing that you notice, um, Eclipse remembers files that I have opened that way. Because the assumption is that the files that I needed yesterday are the same files that I need today. Um, and all the rest is still accessible. And the other thing that's also quite nice in Eclipse dialogs, the cursor is still in this dialog. I can just use cursor down to jump into the list or hit enter to select the first one. So it's very natural to start selecting so I don't have to press tab to get into the list and then use cursor down. So then control O is the quick outline. The quick outline is basically this, the same content as the outline view that we're seeing as a separate view. But yeah, I don't need the mouse for that. Then I can start typing a method name. Again, just cursor down and enter, and I'm there. So if you do that very frequently, if you know what you're seeking, the TV will turn off in five minutes, um, then um, uh, it's a very fast way of navigating code. There are other shortcut keys which are very helpful when editing code. Um, I'll just show that in a quick test procedure. Let's get rid of comments, they're just in the way. Um, so, honest opinion, who's using messages every now and then for debugging? Probably many ABL developers because the debugger is not that popular, um, which is which it should be more popular. It's, it's really working well. Um, but what you can do, um, you can use block selection. So I press um, Alt Shift A, and I could now either use the mouse to select codes that way, or the same works also if you're using the keyboard. And I now hold the shift key down and select that code. And I paste it here using control V. I press a space. I had hold the shift key down. And now I have a three line cursor. And I write basically in three lines at once. And now I want to do a message. So I just write the message statement, get some space. And uh, again, Alt Shift A. Quote, control V, quote, space, control V, and you quickly get a message block like that. So it's something that uh, is very helpful. Then the other thing which is helpful, so let's assume for whatever reason you want to have that code commented out. 
and then later you don't want to comment it out, maybe just a portion of it. Um, probably many developers would be using Control C, uh, Control X to cut and paste it like that. But what you can also do, you can use Alt and cursor up and cursor down to select lines up and down. So if you think the assigns should be going behind the message, you can do that too. And all with the cursor, so I haven't touched the mouse for that. So it's, there's a lot of this which really is, um, um, is made to make working for developers very, very easy. So all shift A is the block selection mode um, and yeah. Custom templates. Templates in developer studio are a mess. Let me first show you one of the things that I mean with that. So whoever thinks it's a great idea to start a class with an empty line and the next line with a space. Either you don't care about your code or the first thing that you do is always you remove the empty line and the space there. And the same when you create methods. They also have a, an empty line between the common block and so. Um, and there's a way to fix that. Uh, there's no way which is obvious in the dialogues of the developer studio. You can create your own macros, so you can change the message macro or the define but not the templates for new files. Um, and it's possible to do that, but it is not the most trivial thing. Um, but it's a little bit like riding a bike. Uh, I must admit, I have but setting up this environment to do that. Um, it was like, okay, I, I still remember how everything was. Progress has released a white paper in 2007, so 14 years ago. Um, by, about that, I didn't find that on progress communities anymore. Um, if you don't have access to the white paper, I guess I can share that with you. Otherwise, we should ask Matt Baker to make it available. And what it takes is it takes writing JET templates. JET is an Eclipse standard for templates, Java emitter templates. Uh, it's a dynamic template format. Um, it's Mainly a, a, a three phases process or two phases process. You write a text file as a template that by a parser gets translated into Java code and that Java code is compiled. Um, and that's executed. So on the Eclipse website, there's a lot of documentation how to build that templates. And it is mainly the same stuff as in WebSpeed, the embedded speed script. So there you have an HTML file with some progress code in it. This HTML file gets first converted into a .w file. The .w file will be compiled. Um, and it's the same stuff. There's a skeleton file, which has some static code, which is used in all the templates. And then based on statement and expression escapes, a Java source code is generated. And that are similar as you use in WebSpeed or ASP.NET or many of these template engines use escapes like that. So in order to do that, you need to set up a developer studio for that. So there's Matt Baker's white paper. Um, the documentation there is extremely outdated, mainly the versions of the templates that you need, of the plugins that you need to install and stuff like that. But with some creativity, you get it to working. Uh, in the white paper, he mentions that you need to install the Eclipse modeling framework plugin that's no longer required. Progress ships the source code templates which are used in Developer Studio as part of the Progress install directory. So in OE IDE, which is the Developer Studio folder, Eclipse plugins, blah, 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 you find the original templates used by Progress software. And if you look into the new class template, you see why it always starts with an empty line in the space. Probably somebody must have failed 15 years ago when doing the code review. So to install that, um, well, we need to install plugins. So we go in the help menu to install new software. And this is now based on OpenMatch 12.2, so the most recent of the two re releases. You select 
the Eclipse project update site from the dropdown and you just type JDT and then we'll be offering you the JDT means you turn Progress Developer Studio into a Java development environment. That's what JDT stands for. Um, and you install the PDE, which is the Eclipse plugin development environment. Um, then for the OpenEdge project, you have to enable it for JET and that is hidden in the file new, JET enabling for OpenEdge project, which sounds a bit like, little bit weird to enable a feature through the file new dialog, but in the end what it does, it creates a file. And it's this .jet properties file. And in this .jet properties file, you name your template folder and the folder that should contain the Java source code. And then you're ready to write templates. And I'll show that now in a live environment. Um, that's an example of these templates. So as part of the template, um, you need to give the template a class name because in the end, it's producing Java class files. Um, you reference the skeleton, which is the static file um, that may contain Java import statements and stuff like that. Um, and then you can have um, this uh, percent sign in the carrots. That's actually executable Java code that are variable definitions and it gets data out of an, an argument. Um, and code, which is just standing outside of any of these escapes, it's just being generated into the template. And what we see there is we see a reference to an object called data. And this data object is basically the input to the template from the wizard. So you create a new class file. So in the class file, you provide the name of the new class. In, in the wizard, you provide the name of the class. You provide um, maybe a description or a, a purpose or whatever. And all that's being provided as input to this. And then you re register the, the, the templates, but that's something I'm going to show you in, a, in an environment where I have this set up. So first thing, if I go into that environment and I go on into the open edge install folder OEIDE Eclipse plugins com open edge PDT which probably stands for progress development T tools text <coughs> templates and that that are the templates provided by progress so when I open the class template don't ask me why they have different extensions um, Let's open it with Developer Studio. Um, so that's the original template pro used by Progress. And everybody who wonders about the empty line and the space, it's just part of the freaking template. Um, so um, to fix that, all you'd have to do is remove it and rebuild the template. And while you're doing that, you could customize the file header so that it matches your company standards. Because if you're not doing that, everybody will be copying and pasting the file head header from somewhere else. Um, so, and um, I've done that here, custom template. So the empty line and the space are gone. Um, our copyright header. Um, and I added a little bit code there. So this is JSON sealizable. We have a certain style of some classes. And uh, with this template, we say if we create a new class that inherits from a certain base class, then we add extra code to that. Um, we have standard include files that we always use. We could have standard using statements there. Um, and the other code that iterates here is typically used when you have a class that implements interfaces to create method stubs for the methods that you need to implement and stuff like that. So with a bit of try and error, you manage that. Right. 
it is possible to share them. Uh, let me first show the registration and then we'll talk about sharing. Uh, but it's a very good question, Jill. So, you shouldn't have said that. Um, so, in, when you have written a custom template, you first need to register it. And therefore, you go in this Open Edge Tools customization editor, and there are the template overrides, and you add for the wizard that you want to customize here the name of the custom template. So in order to use the class template, I have referenced here the Java file that is being the result of that. And then the thing you should not forget is hitting this button here, refresh, refresh the customization options because only then it's becoming active. So then when you create a new class using the standard wizard, the new template is used. Um, to Jill's question about, or Stefan Drissen's question about reusing them, yes. Um, so within this project, and if I um, open that in the System Explorer, there's also a bin folder with the Java classes, the compiled Java classes here. So you can share that to another developer. And then in the preferences dialog, in the Open Edge advanced customization, you provide here the folder that contains the templates. What I think is not shareable is in the customization editor, the mapping of the template classes to the wizards. So you can share the plugin binaries, but the registration, that's something that I think, I mean, there's a file somewhere in the setup, but there's no easy, straightforward way to share that. So don't put that in Git, directly in Git. <laughs> no, no way, way that I'm aware of. And I think it's, it's even something which is written in the progress install directory and not in the workspace. So let's move further because I heard that Jill wants to have a session after me here. Um, some startup parameters. Um, one about the workspace location minus clean and the author name, just some examples. I'm not going to cover memory settings here. That would be a subject for a whole new session. And honestly, with the 64-bit versions of Developer Studio, memory is not such a big concern anymore. So there's a minus data parameter which you can add command line of developer studio and that just pre-selects the workspace. So that's something which I find very, find very handy. If I have for different customer projects, different workspaces, then I have one folder on the desktop with all the shortcuts for one project and that contains launching the Eclipse workspace directly without the selection. Then there's a minus clean parameter. I see many developers who are using minus clean because they think it does any useful stuff and it doesn't. Um, what minus clean does, it resets the plugin configuration cache. Unless you're a Java developer who day in, day out writes new versions of Eclipse plugins, you just don't need this parameter. Um, it just slows down the start by a couple of seconds. Um, so the typical ABL developer will not need that. What, however, might be useful is setting the author name. Um, the templates, again, they, by default, use your Windows username as the author of a file. And that's just a selection from systems or various customers for my name. Um, and I want, don't want to have any of that in the source code. Instead, I want to have my name and maybe my company name. And you can do that by starting Eclipse with the minus VM args parameter. VM args passes arguments into the Java runtime. Minus D sets a variable, user.name, and what you pass in there is being used then as the username for templates. Just be careful if you copy and paste that from a web page or whatever, then it typically uses the more artistic versions of the quotes or the minus. It, it needs to be the simple programmers really shift F2 quote and minus and nothing, nothing else. And then the wizard has that pre-filled in. Some useful plugins, um, dev style, that's something that a couple months ago Carl Verbeest has uh, introduced me to. 
it's a plugin with some nice features and it just makes, it, makes Developer Studio look like a modern in development environment. I mean, this gray and gray of Eclipse that's equally sad as the gray and gray of Progus GUI. Um, everybody should have a great JSON editor, that's mine. And I like integrating a terminal into the development environment. I'm going to introduce them now. So this DevStyle plugin introduced itself as the darkest dark theme for Eclipse. Um, I'm for, I don't know why for Eclipse, I, 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 I don't like the dark theme. I use Visual Studio Code as a dark theme, but Eclipse, I don't know why. I use a bluish template there. So it has beautiful alternative color uh, themes. But it has some other features for navigating code and uh, selecting workspaces and uh, different search, which I'm going to show you here. So for the selection, when you have that installed, you, you already see the result of this bluish one that I'm using. But there's also the darkest dark, and there's a very light, light one that you could be using. When launching Developer Studio, this is the alternative workspace selector. So it shows the previously used workspace together with when you used them uh, most recently ago in this uh, yeah, more full page rather than this small dialog with a drop down. Um, could also open directly files that you had opened recently, so very nice. Um, there's an inline file search, um, which is behaving much more like the search in Visual Studio Code. So for those people which are using Visual Studio Code for a lot of stuff and uh, Developer Studio, that makes it nice and easy. Um, if you're in the search um, for something, so Control F, you can use cursor up or enter to jump to the next match. Um, there's also search and replace. For search and replace, you have to open the dialog by clicking on the carrot down. Um, and uh, then you have search and replace there. Um, and the breadcrumb navigation, let me show you that. Breadcrumb navigation is, uh, so I have a file open <coughs> and between the toolbar and the editor, you see there's a line with the, which has the trail of that file. Um, I can click on either of the components of the path and navigate through them. And it's just an alternative way of navigating through code, which sometimes just is nicer than having to, having to use the scroll wheel up and down a lot in the, in the Project Explorer. Um, that plugin is free of charge. So uh, this is something you could try out. Um, yeah, JSON editor. Um, we have a lot of um, JSON files with configuration or yeah, source code like elements in our applications. So if I would be opening yeah, like this one. So in order to have um, nice collapsible sections and uh, also syntax checks, so if you don't do your quotes and colons correct, etc., you get a check immediately. So that is the JSON editor that we use. Um, has some formatting options. Uh, can auto format code if you want. So right click and uh, format. So that's also something which is very useful. When you install such a plugin that should be dealing with files of a certain type, Maybe you have, like we have, JSON files which have a different extension than .json. Um, if you want to open any file with a custom plugin, then you go on the open with other, and then comes this dialog there, where you can then search all the various plugins. Um, and there, when you do that once, you also have the option to use it the next time for all files with a file extension. It's also very useful. So next thing is a terminal editor. It's also something which I've seen the first time in Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual Studio Code has the ability to uh, bring, um, to embed a terminal, edit, terminal in the development environment. And Angular developers use that a lot for invoking code, gen code generators, ng, gen, form, blah, 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 for instance. And the same is there for Eclipse 2. Um, so I've installed this TM terminal, the website from where it was 
on the previous slide. And with that, I can have a Windows terminal embedded in Eclipse. So, and in order to use that, so it's like here. And um, just like the Angular developer, we then also have said, okay, well, what the Angular developers do, we can do too. So we can use that and it's basically invoking a code generator and um, build was successful and it has now generated through this something. So it's also useful for, I don't know, deleting log files if you want to have a fresh log file or whatever. And um, so you can start a new terminal window or if you're on any file or folder, whatever that is, you can also do the show in local terminal. And then it opens a terminal window in the directory of that file. So also useful every now and then. Yeah, OEDT. OEDT is the, well, besides Progress Develop Studio itself, the only commercial um, plugin that I'm showing here. Uh, OpenMatch Developer Tools by a German Progress partner, um, well, originally developed by them now maintained by a company called Omicra. Um, and that's an extension to Developer Studio, which, which adds lots of really useful features. One is when you compile code, it always happens in the background. So it's a non-blocking builder. You don't have the situation that you have to wait for five minutes until your project is compiled just because Progress Developer Studio wanted to compile. It's always happening in the background. Uh, it has a great and powerful dependency builder, so if you change an include file or a method or whatever, he knows who uses that and only compiles those. Um, it has a much better outline support. You, through the outline support in the Project Explorer, you can navigate straight into a method. It has some refactoring um, functionality when renaming class files. It can refactor the references to that name within the class and external references and so on. The editor is really great. Um, the code assist is very, very fast. Um, it brings much more reliable proposal. You have um, code proposals for parameters and stuff like that. Really, really nice. Um, and I'm just going to show you two features which I use fairly often. So if I go into any of the test files here, Um, so that is a method um, that expects a handle parameter and it would offer me here in this list of potential parameters every variable of type handle but it also shows me buffers because maybe I want to pass the handle of the buffer there um, the difference here is you really see that the people that have written OEDT are writing progress code themselves. And the other thing is um, also from the real world is um, you very often need the debug listing of an ABL code because error messages refer to line numbers in the debug listing file, runtime error messages. So, and I just create the debug listing of that and it has everything in there and the line numbers that I see here are exactly the line numbers that are reference in the stack trace of an error message. So a lot of nice things. I could probably spend two hours talking about OEDT alone, but I only have six minutes left. So don't do that today. Um, text drag and drop. Um, those of you who have implemented drag and drop on Windows applications um, will probably know that yeah, some controls have some support for drag and drop built in and you can implement drag and drop support um, through handling various events. Um, and when dragging and dropping, typically with, with files and source codes, you can either drag references to files or you drag source code. Uh, and 
by default, I mean, if you drag a file into the developer studio, it will copy it in the workspace or edit it, open it in the editor or so. But we have a use case in our um, tooling where in a repository of UI designs, we make object names of, of UI controls or so. And when we are writing the UI handling code in developer studio, we, need, we may need to know the name of an object. And since this is not coming from source code, the editor cannot provide me code completion for that because it's just not there. Um, so we utilize the fact that the recent Eclipse versions support text and drop, drag and drop. Don't ask me when it started doing that. 10 years ago, it didn't do that. Um, now it does. And with that feature, what we can do, and we do that from a GUI for .NET tool because the classic progress GUI cannot be the initiator of a text drag and drop. So I have here an object name, and this field is disabled because I don't need to edit it. But through text drag and drop, I can get the text pasted there. That's extremely useful for these kind of things. And I know that not only we and or our customers, that, that many other partners have, I don't know, and if it's just a reference to a ticket number from a progress-based ticketing system or whatever that you need to drag and drop every now into the source code. So all we have to do for that is, in the mouse down event handler of this text box, um, we check whether the mouse down is really within the correct boundaries, and then do drag drop with the text of that control and the effect of copy. That's all we need to do. So if you have a GUI for .NET screen and you want to be able to drag and drop into the source code, you can do it like that. <coughs> so, and now Eclipse on high DPI displays. Um, so what are high dis DPI displays? Well, that are typically laptop screens, um, which have extremely high um, surface, like, like 4K or most, most of them have actually 6K displays or so. Um, and um, on a very small screen. So Microsoft Surface, for instance, on a 13-inch on a screen has a resolution of 3,000 by 2,000 pixels. What you have to do then is you typically set scaling to 200%, 250 or 300%. No problem with the studio. It just scales nicely. Um, Eclipse has its problems with that. Um, it does well in these environments. And uh, some of the effects can be that uh, the menu is big, but the toolbar buttons, you need a magnifying glass to, to be able to click on them um, compared to if you run it on a, on a normal size. The GUI for .NET Visual Designer, because it's a mashup between Java UI and .NET UI, is extremely challenging to use. The property grid can be like this. It should be like that, and um, I think there are other combinations where then the Visual Designer just doesn't load, it just appears empty. So, and I'm referring here to recent versions of Windows because Microsoft has changed in various of the half-year updates of Windows 10 the behavior also a little bit, and um, Eclipse has tried to work against it. So on a recent version of Windows with a recent, recent version of Pro's Developer Studio, what I do is I create a custom shortcut for the eclipse.exe file. So I'm not using the batch file that Progress uses to start developing. That doesn't work for me. Um, if you read in the launch pdsoe.batch file, you see that Progress is trying to fix that also by, by adding startup parameters or creating registry key at runtime. It just doesn't work for me. So that's why I'm just creating a copy of the Eclipse Exe. I do that anyway because then I can also add additional startup parameters like my developer name and, and uh, workspace location. And then I go into the properties of that shortcut on the compatibility tab, change high DPI settings, and I use the system enhanced. And that just works best for me. As a result of that, that's the only semi-negative side effect, the splash screen of Pro's Developer Studio. It may be appearing just as one image, and then you see the image in two by two. So you see, actually see the splash screen image twice. But I can live with that. 
Um, so that's my recommendation there. And so I ended on time, Mr. Carrot. <laughs> Any questions? There were a few comments during the presentation, but uh, just, uh, just a simple one uh, from Arno. Uh, so, does OEDT have a better intelligence and pop up for methods, uh, such as for read JSON? For does example? OEDT have what? Uh, a better intelligence pop up for read JSON, for example, to have the appropriate types uh, for read JSON. You mean on, on widget methods? Uh, yes. Who? You know when was the last time that I used ABL GUI? Um, I don't know. So that all looks like methods of a button. So I think. And if you input the parameter types, if you execute. Well, oh, it knows yeah, the type. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's with the built-in methods of the session system handle and other stuff. The, the code completion on those parameters works well. And here it looks like that on the button. I'm just seeing methods of the button. So that looks filtered pretty well. Another question? No. Get? Yeah. Um, oh, I see, just one. Uh, uh, are you going to share the, your uh, configuration, macro, templates? Uh, do you have any, anything where this is shared or? I could share my templates, but in order to, um, to build them up, I mean, the, the, the biggest piece of work is not removing the empty line from the template, it's installing the plugins and, and making that configuration. Um, so um, maybe it would be something if I have ever time for kind of like a blog article on how to do that, or this 15-year-old white paper from Matt Baker, um, which I'm sure we can make available. Get? Uh, in our workspace, you can find uh, different working sets. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to have a startup parameter to go directly into a working set? Not that I'm aware of. Um, so the question was, you can define working sets. And working sets are actually um, selections of subsets of the files. So that could be by module. And if you use working sets, you can select working sets from this menu. So I don't have any selected here. And Gerd's question was whether if you have working sets that you could select them by a startup pyramid. I, I, I don't know. Um, most likely not, because I read quite a few times through the startup parameters of Eclipse, and, and I just never fell across something like that. Maybe it's something that through an Eclipse plugin you can do. Um, what we recently did, or well, Sebastian, um, is um, he's, he's a Java programmer and he started writing Eclipse plugins and you have a lot of influence on the functionality and the look of Eclipse through Eclipse plugins. And um, uh, plugins can influence each other and when, when they developed for that. Uh, I mean, you see that here. I mean, the, the complete look and feel, including all the icons of compile errors and whatever, um, has, has changed through a plugin. So maybe it would be possible through a custom plugin. So if there are no additional questions, then well, thanks for your time, and see you later. <laughs>